<clears throat> Heavenly Father, oh, how we thank you for oh, how you bless us. And so this morning, Lord, we want to talk about how to bless you, what that looks like. Thank you for the psalm that um, in just three short verses, uh, you talk to us and, and instruct us on how to bless you. What an amazing, amazing journey this has been as we have journeyed with the pilgrims to Jerusalem, as we journey on our trip to our Jerusalem. And so, Lord, I just pray right now, oh, Holy Spirit, would you just take over this time, our, our, our minds, our thoughts, we welcome you to um, teach us what, whatever it is that we personally need to hear. So we just dedicate this teaching time to you and ask that you would mightily, mightily speak to our hearts. We love you. We praise you. Thank you for your blessings. And we want to bless you back. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Well, can you believe we're on our last Psalm of Ascents? I can't believe it. Look at this. I'm trying to get my book open here and everything. Oh. And um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about, here we are, we are here, now what? We are here, we've come to the end of the journey, now what? Um, <clears throat> we're entering the, the uh, Easter season, and we know that most churches put tremendous thought into this season because of the number of visitors. So many people, you know, with... Um, family members that are perhaps walked away from the church or not interested so much, they'll say, hey, it's, it's Easter. Come on. It's like the, you know, the entree into the spring season. Come on and go to church with me. And oftentimes we'll have many, many visitors within the church that come like at Christmas time and Easter time, right? And so pastors, you know, wonderfully think through carefully. They put hours of prep and prayer. How can we do? What can we do to minister and draw people in these visitors that are with us maybe once or twice a year and how can we do that there's and there's a tremendous anticipation will it be all we hope will it be um, all we expect as, as we're praying expectantly for what God's going to do in a mighty way in our the special service a few years ago or maybe I should say some years ago uh, Bob was an interim at Christ the Rock Church here in, kind of in our neighborhood and one Easter season, he and multiple pastors in our area gathered together with what I'm just talking to you about, with anticipation and prayerfully, what can we do? And um, they thought, you know what, wouldn't it be interesting for this Easter season to try and have the Easter service at C.B. Smith Park? What would that look like? And so they began praying and um putting together the, you know, the plan and uh, all the, the pastors entered into that and um, with, with expectation. They even had one of, the, uh, one of the pastors on staff said, hey, why don't we get an airplane with a banner that says, come to Easter at C.B. Smith? And they flew that around the beaches and so forth. You know what happened? 12,000 people came. 12,000 people came, and several hundred people gave their hearts to the Lord. Wow. Anticipation. Anticipation. So they were saying, we are here Sunday morning, Easter. Now what? And wow, did God do a work or what? And that's kind of the feel that we have as the pilgrims are ending their trip, the um, the, the ascent into worship in Jerusalem that, okay, we're here. Now what are we going to do? What's going to happen? What's happening? And um, so it's a, a feeling of anticipation. Now the next few weeks, um, that doesn't mean you can't come to Bible study next week or the next or the next because, uh, yes, we're done with the Psalms of Ascent, but we're going to study a few other favorites. We're going to study Psalm 91. Oh my goodness, is that an amazing psalm? And then we're going to spend two weeks on Psalm 23. So don't miss, even though we're... we're finishing this this section. Uh, we began with Psalm 120, the first of the Psalms of Ascent, and it was the theme of repentance. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, a, a theme of repentance. And the Hebrew word for repentance is teshuba, turning from the world and turning to God. Turning from the world and turning to God in repentance, which is 
the initial move in a life goal set on God, a pilgrimage toward him, the first thing we need to do is say, I'm turning away from the world, worldly thinking, worldly actions, and I'm going to turn and follow the Lord. And so that's what we uh, kind of talked about at the very beginning. And, to the, and, and that's for the people at the crossroads that are maybe trying to make a decision. Should I? Shouldn't I? What does this look like? What am I? Do I really want to follow this path? And, and, and it's a, you know, the idea of turning away and turning to God. It's to take a step toward discipleship, a step toward a, a beginning to live in faith. And each of the Psalms that followed really described a part of what, it, what takes place along the pilgrim way, of what it looks like as you're making your pilgrimage to Zion, or for us, our holy Zion, our, our heavenly Zion. And among those who turn to God to follow him through Jesus, this last Psalm, 134, is a call to worship, a call to worship. All of them have been that in an essence, haven't they? In some form or another, they've been kind of uh, a, a psalm of worship. But this one is sort of the climactic one talking about as you have turned from the world to God in repentance, now let's worship him. So A, what is our response when we get to the end of a journey? What is our response when we get to the end of the journey? What will happen when the goal is finally realized? Number one, will it be disappointment? Will it be all that we anticipated or will we be disappointed? Boy, just as the pastors that I just mentioned to you at that Easter celebration hoped and prayed for, they had an amazing answer, didn't they? Incredible. They anticipated and prayed for, and wow, God just showed up in a mighty way. So is it, will it be disappointed, disappointment or um, will it be something that God does incredibly, powerfully, in our lives as we have made that journey. Number two, how do we have the correct response? What is our first response? How do we have the correct response? How do we keep the freshness of our pilgrimage? How do we keep that freshness? When we've been on the, that pilgrimage for a while, how do we keep it from becoming, oh, okay, repetitive, humdrum, okay, yeah, I serve the Lord. Yeah, I, you know, I walk with the Lord. How do we keep it from getting just sort of ordinary and everyday and humdrum? How do we keep life and freshness in our pilgrimage? And this psalm gives us a clue how to retain that freshness. The final psalm gives us a clue to how to, how to react in a way that will not be disappointing. So I'm going to read the psalm. It's so, so long. So hang in there with me, all three <laughs> verses. And um, I'm going to read it, and then we're going to take it apart word, word for word. Psalm 134, come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Now, you know what the main word is in this, this psalm. You've heard it three times. The key word is blessing, blessing. What does that mean? The word bless is in each verse of the psalm, isn't it? Number one, verse one, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Number two, lift up your hands and bless the Lord. And verse three, the Lord bless you from Zion. Now, interestingly, there are two words for blessing in Hebrew. Two words for blessing in Hebrew. The first understanding of blessing we studied in Psalm 1, and then we also studied in Psalm 128. One meaning, number one, blessing means a sense of well-being, and that would perhaps be more of our understanding in English as we use that word blessing. It means happiness and a sense of well-being. It was used um, only in a description of us, of mankind that we experience when God blesses us. Let me say that again. Blesses us, gives us tangible blessings. That's the first understanding. It's about the human experience. You know, I am so blessed. And it talks about, we talked about that in a great deal in Psalm 128. Human experiences when things are going my way. I'm blessed because I have good joy, good health, a good marriage, my kids are doing okay, or whatever. 
Um, that is the, the first idea of blessing. Second one, meaning in Hebrew, is barak, barak. And the second word, bless or barak, is something that is used also of blessing God and connecting with him. And we see that verse in here. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But blessing God in this word cannot be separated from verse 3, where it says, may the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. He blesses us. God blesses us with a good life blessing. And then in turn, we can bless him. We can bless him too. Blessing means God sharing himself with us. It's more than just everything happening, right? Hey, I got that parking place in, in Publix. Thank you, Lord, or whatever, you know, those kind of human things that the first one kind of communicates. This one is about sharing himself with us. It is so far above, you know, the, the tangible, you know, um, wow, I found that thing on sale. Uh, that kind of a, a blessing that the first word talks about. Hebrew for blessing here describes what God does for us and among us. So much more than material and temporal blessings. To receive these blessings are more than we ever, ever want. They are exceedingly abundantly above all that we would what? Ask or think, uh, Ephesians 3.20. Or here's another favorite of mine that talks about the abundance of God's blessings in our life that are not that are so far above the temporal blessings. John 1, 16 in the NIV says this, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Is that a great verse? I mean, think about this, the fullness of his grace. Does God have a lot of grace? Is there quite a bit of fullness in his grace? Absolutely, and from that grace, we have received blessing after blessing. Notice, going back to verse 3 of our psalm, it says, bless from Zion. That's the key, or out of Zion, as it says in the NIV. So from, first of all, God has blessed us from the heavenly places, and so then in turn, we will bless him. See, so going back to that idea, how does God bless us? How does God bless us out of Zion, or from Zion? What are the incredible blessings from Zion or out of, uh, of Zion. Number one, he enters into relationship with us. There's a connection, a comfort of togetherness. Um, when he, we know without a shadow of a doubt that he is not only aware of what we might be dealing with, but he is with us in it. Because we live, how many times have we said this? We live in a, a fallen, wicked world, and so we are going to have things happen in our lives. And because of that, in the midst of that, God is saying, I will be with you. That is one of the blessings that he pours out upon us from heaven. Um, when Bob had his surgery uh, a few weeks ago, we were in the hospital from 7 o'clock in the morning till almost 7 o'clock at night. And um, as we made our way into the um, main hospital area and sat down, and all of a sudden through the door came Roby, my son. And it was just so amazing. And he stayed the entire time, except a couple hours at the very end, because he's the soccer coach for Little Hopi. And so those last couple hours he had to go, but stayed all day and sat with us and me and, you know, on and on. And there is not a shadow of a doubt that it was a blessing from the Lord. Placed it on his heart. Go be with your mom and dad. That was a blessing. Did we? Did the, the surgery get canceled? No. But in the midst, God laid it on his heart to come and be with me and Bob. Amazing. That's the picture here, that God in the midst of our difficult times is right there with us. Here's our problem. We just need to open our eyes <laughs> and watch for him and see him. Wow. Anyway, number two. Not only is he with us in the midst, he enters into relationship with us. Number two, he pours out his own life for us. You know, as, again, as we how timely this is, as we're beginning to prepare for Easter. And what I love to do in this season, just like in the Christmas season, kind of reading through all the things that happened before Christmas, I love to read through 
uh, what the week before Easter looked like. It's just so informative and so heart warming and wrenching <laughs> as we see what the Lord um, did and prayed for us in the midst of what was going on about the lamb that was slain, the lamb that was slain. Each year at Passover, I love this little tidbit of fat because I think it just, anyway, I like it. <laughs> Lambs were brought in for sacrifice that was a symbol of the Lamb of God. Now Jesus on the triumphal entry came in one gate into Jerusalem and into another gate came one fourth of a million lambs for Passover because Passover many times was about the same time as our Easter and that year of course when Jesus went to the cross and then rose again from the grave it was right at Passover time, wasn't it? And so here were all these lambs coming in through another gate. Now let me tell, ask you a question. If there are one-fourth of a million, I'm trying to think of how many thousand that is. 250, thank you. Boy, we've got some math whizzes in here. Um, not here, but anyway. <laughs> so 200, think about this. Even if they went into different gates, as, there, as Jesus was preparing to come into Jerusalem, do you think he might have seen a couple of lambs on the road? Can you imagine the Lord seeing all of these lambs making their way into Jerusalem to provide a picture for the Jewish people about what he was about to do on their behalf and our behalf? Amazing, amazing. Anyway, he poured out and continues to pour out for us. Number three, he shares the goodness of his spirit. Uh, before Jesus left, he said, I'm going to send you a helper, a counselor, somebody to come alongside the Holy Spirit to help us and to fill us when we receive Jesus and uh, to give us strength to do the calling of our gifts. Each of us, we've talked about this so many times before, that each of us have a spiritual gifting that God has given us and he's given us the Holy Spirit to strengthen us to, to walk in that gifting that we offer to the rest of each other um, in, in the Christian world. And he also gives us Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that as we are ministering our giftings to each other, he gives us these gifts with which to do it the fruits of the spirit how many times i've said going into a you know sort of a scary meeting or a conversation with somebody and i'll say oh lord please give me the, the fruits of the spirit as i go into this meeting love joy peace patience and praying that and guess what he he does and he gives us that that verse is a promise to us that he will fill us with the fruits as we pray for it number four he communicates through hearing and answering he communicates through hearing and answering. We're talking again about how God blesses us beyond the temporal and material. These are way above it that we're talking about here. And four, he communicates through hearing and answering. There are just some times we never understand when something is the best. And you know what? As 21st century American Christians, don't we kind of, we sort of want to know. It's kind of in our DNA. We need to know. God, what in the world is going on here? How come you haven't answered me yesterday? What is happening? And it's kind of in our DNA, our natural person, to want to know what is going on, to understand. But here's the thing. We can't see the end, but God can. We can't see the end, but God can. His ways, what he's doing, how, how he is growing us or training us or teaching us through what is going on in our, in our lives. Romans 11, 33 and 34 says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Boy, don't we need to put that on the refrigerator for bad mornings, right? Um, <clears throat> how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor. We cannot, we don't know his mind, but here's the thing. 
we can know him. In his timing and in his way, we can trust him. All that he says about himself, we can trust who our mighty father is, can't we? Even if we don't understand right now what's going on or when it's going to change or whatever, we can always know that he knows the best. He loves us more. Isn't this an interesting thought? Do you realize that he loves you more than you even love yourself? Because we don't have perfect love, do we? But God does. So he loves us more. So the answer is going to be something that will so benefit us. One of my favorite verses uh, is Deuteronomy verses, Deuteronomy 32, verses 9 and 11 and 12. And it says this, but the Lord's portion is his people. Like an eagle stirs up its nest and flutters over its young, spreading out its wings and catching them, bearing them on its pinions. And pinions is another word for feathers. The Lord alone guided him. And I think on those bad mornings when we're struggling to say, Lord, is this the day things are going to change? Is this the day I'm going to finally get an answer? Is this when things are going to go the way I think they should go? To think about him being like a, a mother eagle, swirling around you, carrying you on his wings, checking the, the, the nest to make sure everything's okay, and carrying you you know up above the problem area and just being with you and holding you and loving you. Such a, a beautiful picture. We're the eagleettes. Is there such a word? We're the eaglets. We just made it. We just coined it, right? Anyway, we're the baby eagles, and God is our eagle that swoop, swoops us up and carries us as we're going through that if we just let him do it rather than fight him. I can figure this out myself, Lord. Please, come on. I have a great idea I can give you to help me in the situation or whatever it is. Then the most incredible blessing from Zion 5, he provided a way for us to live eternally with him. Is that amazing? You know, I think sometimes, again, as 21st century uh, um, Americans, we kind of, we're all about life and all about living. And we forget the fact that when we get to heaven, it's going to be unimaginably wonderful. And I asked Maria if, we, if it would be okay if I talked about this, but this is something that she and I have talked about so much as she lost her 14-year-old granddaughter, Reese, um, a while back. And, you know, at first you're like, a 14-year-old, how is it that she would die? No, she didn't die. She got to go to heaven. She's walking with Jesus, the streets of gold. She's talking to him and, and, and finding out all the things that we would love to ask Jesus. And she knows all those things. She was spared having to go through what we have to deal with sometimes in our lives. Wow, that is not a punishment. That is a blessing beyond description to get to go to heaven. Wow, wow. Having perfect circumstances pale next to the blessings of uh, having, of being able to go to heaven. Having, having yes to all the things we want in life pales next to that. There's a book that was written on God by Carl Henry, and it's entitled God Who Stands, Stoops, and Stays. Stands, Stoops, and Stays. That's such a beautiful description of God in our lives, I think. First of all, he stands. He's the um, fundamental and dependable part of our life like a solid rock. He stands. And then God stoops. He meets us where we are and participates in our mundane, everyday lives. Okay, I'm doing the laundry this morning. I, get to get to go, I need to go to the grocery store. I need to do this. I need to get the kids to school or whatever it is. We have such mundane lives. But he stoops to meet us in our lives, in our everyday lives. And then lastly, he stays. He sticks with us through the hard times and the good times, through the hard times and the good times. He stays. He stays with us. God shares himself with us. And what greater, what greater blessing could there be than that, that he shares himself with us? 
especially in those times when we can't figure out what's going on and what he's doing uh, in our lives. Wow. So next, what is our response back to God? We've talk, been talking about how God blesses us way beyond temporal blessings, how the main way that God uh, uh, blesses us is through his presence and through his ordering of our life. But then what is our response back to God? In light of considering what God has done for us, we get begin to understand what the Hebrew word barak, barak, for bless God is meant in verse 1 and 2. In response to all that God does in our lives, we in turn bless him. We in turn bless him. A, we bless God back. We bless God back. It's because of and through God that we are able to even bless him. And how do we do that? What does that look like? How, um, how the blessed has turned, being the, blah, the blessed, you and me, <laughs> are turning now to bless him, to bless him. Now, how do we do that? Number one, we kneel in adoration. We kneel in adoration. In, in Hebrew, that's what bless means, to kneel in adoration a sense of praise and gratitude for the blessings received. And the, the idea of kneeling is, is um, to just to, that he is so amazing and he is so great and he's done so much in my life. So just in adoration, admiring and honoring him, I want to bless him back. Now, how in the world can we bless God? Wow, that's kind of unimaginable um, that we could bless God. So let's take a look at that. Um, also, the word adoration, kneel in adoration, has a sense of pride, praise and gratitude for the blessings received. Lord, because of all that you've done in my life, all that you, at Easter time, became, well, at Christmas time, became a man, and then at Easter time, took my sins upon you and died a horrific death. It wasn't just, you know, five minutes on the cross and I'm gone, or it wasn't just... Um, some other execution that would have been far less painful and horrifying as a crucifixion and then rose from the dead as a symbol that we will be rising because of him. So um, anyway, the sense of, uh, of praise and gratitude for all that God has done in our life, and that's why in some version the word here is translated praise. You may have that in your version. But kneel and praise gives us the feeling of humble praise, like I cannot believe he would do that for me, is the feeling that we get from how it's described. Who am I to deserve this? Who am I to deserve all that you did, Lord, if only you died on the cross and rose again so that I could be with you in heaven? How many times have I said that? And yet you participate in our lives day in and day out. How, how do I deserve this? What a contrast to the entitlement mentality of our culture and ourselves, our flesh. So the second way to respond to what God has done is, number two, we praise with gratitude. We praise in gratitude. The idea of undeserving gratitude. Me, Lord, that you would do that for me. I, I just can't believe it. Um, you know, the feeling of how could God bless me so much? How could he make me feel loved so much? in my life. I'm so undeserving. Now, last week I told you a really bad example about Bob. Do you remember the motor oil with the fraternity <laughs> brothers on the beach? Only one day, but he, I, I told you that really bad example. So today I'm going to give you a really good example, okay? He, um, many mornings, will unload the dishwasher for me. And many mornings he, I will come down, you know, where's my coffee? And he's Mr early bird, and he'll say, how's your gas doing, babe? And I'll say, well, I'm about a fourth of a tank. And he'll go, okay, grabs the keys, and 5.30 in the morning, phew, off he goes to fill the tank. Those kinds of things. And then here's a really fun one. Some of you whose husbands attend the Thursday morning men's Bible study here at Sheridan House, um, there's a, a gentleman that lives in way south Miami. And every single week, he brings multiple trays of Cuban sandwiches. And, um, and and if he's not going to be there that day, I mean, south, south. Is Kendall really, really south? Okay, I think that may be it. But anyway, 
if he's not going to be there, he has somebody else that's in the Bible study go down and get it, or he goes get some and delivers it to him. But somehow he never misses Cuban sandwiches. And guess what my beloved husband does? Every week he gets a little plate, puts a Cuban sandwich, and brings it home. And then races back to Sheridan House to finish what he's supposed to. Is that sweet or what? Does that make me feel loved or what? Absolutely. Although the guys are really funny. They'll say, yeah, right, you're going to take that to Rosemary. You think we believe that? <laughs> but they're so yummy. Have you ever had one? Yes. Honey on the top. and Oh, they're just deadly. But anyway, those little things make me feel loved and cared for. And that is what God does in our lives. Makes us feel loved and cared for. Again, we just have to keep our eyes open and watchful. That should be so characteristic of our praise, a humble disbelief, God, that you would do all that for me. Wow, a humble disbelief. People who have received um, blessings are generally, hopefully, good at giving back. We have a, a, a couple that years ago when our children were small would every summer invite us to go to North Carolina and stay in their home. And um, they would even call us and say, um, so what would be the good dates for the Barnes family to come up here? We're going to kind of plan our trip up to the North Carolina around that. And we just were blown away that summer after summer after summer, they would um, invite us to, to come up there. And we'd say, thank you. I just can't believe you let us go there. And they said, oh, my goodness, are you kidding? How could we not do that when somebody in another town in North Carolina did that for us summer after summer when our children were little. How could we not be generous with our place after somebody was so generous with us? That's the picture here, that as we have generously received from God blessings, then we bless back. Number B, we extend an invitation. Number one, the invitation is for the servants of the Lord. Back to verse one, come. Bless the Lord, all you servants. Now remember, the persons who first sang this song had been traveling to worship God, and they had now come to the end. They had arrived. So um, what, would they, what, what would they do? They were inviting each other, saying, hey, we're finally here. Oh, my goodness. Let's, let's worship the Lord together. Let's just praise his name. We're here safe and sound. And, and you know all the wonderful things we learned as we sang together on the way here. But now we're here, so now let's, let's worship the Lord. Let's enjoy. Let's join in the, the rich worship in the temple of God. Um, <clears throat> don't hold back. We are finally here. The difficulties are behind us. Those scary times on the road when we saw that coyote or whatever is in Israeli deserts, I don't know, but, you know, or the, the, the pit pot holder holes or oh, dangers, they're, they're all gone now. We're here. We're done. We got here. Let's, let's come on and bless the Lord, to worship him, to praise him. Again, let me read verse one. Come, bless the Lord, or worship him, or praise the Lord, all you servants of, of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Now, the stand by night is a reference to the Levites who attended the temple 24 hours a day. There always had to be a Levite on call, on duty, or whatever the terminology would have been, on ministry. How's that? And what they would do is they'd make sure that, you know, that uh, none of the um, candles were burned out or the fire on the altar was constantly burning and so forth and just made sure that everything was on target within the temple as people came to worship the following day. Now, remember we talked about this last week, we are the priests of the Lord, aren't we? According to 1 Peter 2, 9, we are the royal priesthood, the servants who stand by night. That's us. And so we need to be aware of, okay, Lord, what is it that you have for me to do as your Levite so to speak, as your servant, as the, the one who uh, stands by the night. And number two, the invitation is to weary warriors. Remember, they, I'm sh don't you think after days on the road, making their way to Jerusalem, they might have been a little bit tired? Mm -hmm. 
I'm thinking. I know I would be. Um, have you heard of glam camping? Yeah. Just heard about it for the first time. Glam camping. Where it's clamping? Glamping. Glamping. Got it. And I'm like, what? How could any camping be glamorous? And apparently, oh, they set it up beautifully and all this kind of thing. I just, I can't even imagine it. But give, let me say something to you. This was not glamping. Is that the right word? <laughs> Their trek was not glamping at all. It was treacherous and dangerous and hot and cold and rainy and stormy and all the things that would have gone on at that point in time in um, history. But anyway, um, uh, it, it, they were weary. They were weary. Um, and there's sometimes when we are being called of God to be faithful to him as um, standing through the, attending through the night, when he's called us to do something, and there are times, I don't know if you get this way, but you're just kind of, I'm so tired, Lord. Could I just wait and let me do it next week, okay? And, and we kind of get in that weary mode Sometimes in our lives, dragging our feet, you know, it can become humdrum or repetitive. Okay, I got to do that. I know, okay, Lord, I know you called me to do this, but oh, I'm just so tired of it. Um, you know, and we can become reluctant servants, can't we? We can say, give me a little break. I need a vacation and, you know, all that kind of thing. And um, we can become a reluctant servant. And I know that some of us can become very weary in the journey, very weary on the journey. And here's the thing, we need to stay the course. We need to stay the course. We need to hang in there. Hang in there for Christ's sake because of what he did. We're blessing God by hanging in there, by doing what we have been called to do. Um, Sometimes it's in the workplace. Sometimes it's in, in the home. Whatever it is, this psalm is for you and me. We need to hang in there and minister in the night. Continue on doing uh, daily what we have been called to do. Persevere even when we don't feel like it. And guess what? We're all human beings. And so I know we all go through those seasons where I'm, I'm just done. <laughs> just so tired, Lord. But God is saying, persevere, persevere to um, be minister in the night, as that verse goes to faithfully do what God has called you and me to do as his priests. Also, number C, we extend a command, verse 2. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. Again, these um, remember that the, the pilgrims were singing this to each other, and they're saying, here we are. Let's put all the, the cares of the trip aside. It's not glamping. It's camping, and it was hard, and it was, you know, treacherous. But we're going to put all that aside, and we're going to now focus on God. We're going to worship Him. Let's gather together and worship Him. Number one, the command is for corporate worship. It is throughout the Bible, isn't it? It's not just to exchange stories and socialize. It's not, hey, we're here in Jerusalem. Oh, my goodness, let's do some of those touristy things. Oh, my. You know what? Oh, we're in Jerusalem. I'm going to pick up a couple of souvenirs for my family back home. That's not the focus of these pilgrims. They were saying, we are in Jerusalem. We are here to worship God. We are here to worship God. As Christians, like we talked last week, gathering together in community is so important. Why? Because we lift each other up. We learn from each other. That's one of the blessings of, of uh, our, our Bible study here, that we are around our tables talking about our prayer requests and how God answered them and what do you think this verse means and I think it means that and sharing, sharing, sharing. It is such an important part and such an instruction from the Lord to worship corporately together. Community is important. Um, exchanging stories about all the things that God has done is important for our growth to say them. And we're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Speaking of, I just told him that story about what happened to me last week. And wow, I kind of put that aside and look what God did. So if he did that last week, can he do something like that this week? Absolutely. Or tomorrow or next month or whatever it is. Um, it, it is such a, a, an opportunity for our own growth as well as each other's growth. Um, let's get on with what we were created and redeemed to do. And verse, verse 2 says, lift your hands 
in, whole, in the holy place. It's representative, again, of corporate worship. Um, you had in your, your um, homework, what's the last kind of homework that you do? Optional. optional thank you. Okay, optional, in your optional homework, uh, you had Nehemiah. And verse 5 is just amazing. It's instructing the Israelites to praise the Lord. Uh, verse 5, then the, the Levites said, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessings and praise. Now, how do we do that? What does that look like in our lives today, practically speaking? Number two, the command is for focusing on the character of God. How do we do that? We think and speak of his glory and goodness. We, re we rehash with each other retell with each other his hand in our lives and what he's done and how he's um, been so faithful to us at certain times in our life. And it's a, a way of focusing on the character uh, of God. There's so many scriptures about that. And back to Nehemiah, the very next verse, after instructing people to praise God, it says, for you, verse six, you are, you are the Lord, you alone. You may have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens, with all your hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that's in them, and you preserve all of them. The host of heaven worship you. So what we're to do is lift our voices in gratitude and praise for who God is as we're pondering his majestic, one of the many things, creation. And don't you do that? I, I have, you know, I sit in the corner um, in the morning when I have my devotions, and I can see out the window. Um, now it's a lot later in the morning when the sun starts coming up, but the sun comes up every single day, and the sun goes down every single night, and I can see a palm tree waving in the wind, and I can see little animals fluttering about. And it is such a reminder to think about who our mighty God is. There's never been a day when the sun didn't come up and the sun go down, the moon come up, and the moon go down, except for one day in the Old Testament when God said, no, you're not doing, the sun is not going down or coming up, or I think it was coming, going down. But anyway, point being, God is there every single day, and that verse in Nehemiah is instructing us, look around you. I love that verse in Matthew, um, I think it's chapter 11, where Jesus says, look at the birds, you know, <laughs> Do they have to worry about what they're going to eat and, you know, their feathers and all? However, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this terribly, but the point is they don't have to worry. Why are you worried? Aren't you more important than a bird? And that's what nature does is we look at nature and see how God cares for them and how there's a consistency in uh, how he cares for, for nature. And that should help us to know that that God cares more about you and me than he does a little bird. Yes, wow. <clears throat> so, what should our focus be? It needs to be God. We are invited, we're commanded to focus on God, to bless God, to praise God, and here it is, in good times and in bad times. In bad times, both. A, our focus is not on feelings. Our focus is not on feelings. Notice that there's no mention of feelings in our praise. Oh, I so feel like praising you, God, today because of all that you did. I, I feel, feel um, praise in my heart. No, we are to praise God, not to praise God, only in the times we feel like it. Like maybe you get up in the morning, you just didn't, didn't sleep real well or something, and you say, Lord, I just, I really don't feel like it. I'm just not in a joyful mood. So, you know, I'm going to just wait till tomorrow to think about you, praise you, pray, pray, and you know, I just don't feel so good today, so I'll see you tomorrow, okay, God? No, <laughs> that is not the way it is. That's not the response of this psalm. The response of the psalm is, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, when you feel good and when you're in a bad, good mood. No, it doesn't say that, does it? 
Bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Maybe your, your feelings will follow suit. Often it does. I have a friend who, she says, when my mind goes to dark places, I listen to praise music immediately. I turn on praise music and I listen, listen, listen. And that just so ministers to my heart. It helps me kick away that, uh, the, the bad thoughts that are filling my mind. Now, here's the interesting thing. Um, that is so contrary to our feelings-oriented culture, isn't it? We hear out there, follow your heart. Do what seems best to you. What do you want to do? How do you feel about this? And our culture, and that really resonates with our hearts because we, as human beings, are selfishly oriented, aren't we? So we kind of, oh, that, that's good. Yeah, you're right. Uh, do what feels good to you. And we, that that kind of resonates with us. But our feelings can be so deceptive. They can change at a whim. Think about this. Maybe you get up in the morning and you had, did have a wonderful night's sleep and you put your feet on the ground. And, All right, Lord, I'm ready to go forward here and you're up and ready. And then you have one sullen family member that comes down and, and you're like, okay. Or you get on I-95 and you're like, okay, that guy almost ran me off the road again. And what happens? You start hanging your head. We're so susceptible to our feelings. We should never base our faith on our feelings because they are too changeable and unreliable. Too changeable and unreliable. We should do just the opposite of responding um, by how we feel, by finding the right things to do, practice the actions, and many times your feelings will follow. Just the opposite of what our world teaches. Do what you're called to do, and then many times, graciously, the Lord will give us the feelings um, to do. There is a, that is the older, older wisdom. By changing our behavior, we can change our feelings, rather than, oh, our feelings should determine our behavior. No, change your behavior and we can change our feeling. There's a Puritan prayer. I have a book that has just full of prayers that the Puritan pastors wrote, and they kind of like old-timey language, but they just are profound, and here's one. Help me to honor thee by believing before I feel. For great is the sin if I make feeling a cause of faith, a cause of faith. Go through the actions of blessing the Lord and your spirit will pick up the cue and follow along. Do your gratitude, voice your thanks, and the feelings will follow. The feelings will follow. There's nothing more healing than praising the Lord when your heart is broken or you're feeling low. When it is focused on God and praising, blessing Him, as the Psalm says, we will never be disappointed. Never be disappointed if we're focused on God and praising Him, uh, blessing Him. So first thing, we are not to focus on feelings. Second thing, B, our focus is not on self. We take ourselves so seriously, don't we? I mean, it's just part of the, the human makeup. We need to take God seriously and not ourselves. God does not need us. He chose us. He allows us to be a part of um, what he is doing. It's a profound privilege. I don't know if you've <clears throat> heard the name um, Karl Barth. He was one of the um, most gifted theologians probably of all time. And um, he wrote, he had a massive mind. He lived, he was Swiss. He lived in Switzerland. He had a massive line, uh, mind. He wrote six million words, seven million, uh, seven thousand pages in 12 volumes. Uh, uh, books on 12 volume books, book volumes, you know what I'm saying, on theology, plus 40 to 50 other books and several hundred articles on theology. Amazing, amazing mind. And, you know, he lived years and years and years ago. And there was a man who was visiting uh, the town where Karl Barth lived. And Karl Barth ran into him on the bus. 
And so he was, you know, being, he, you know, Carl Barth, the one thing about him, the whole point I'm telling you here, is he had a very cheerful joyfulness. He didn't take himself so seriously. Here was, he was this, the greatest, one of the greatest minds of all time. And he was just like, so how are you doing? And, you know, just a real cheerfulness about, about his, his um, character. And so anyway, the man on the bus, you know, he said, hey, you know, welcome to, to Basel, Switzerland. And uh, what, are you, what are you doing here? And um, he said, oh, you know, I wanted to see the city. And he says, and I think there's that great man named Carl Barth. And he lives here. And, oh, if I could meet him or see him, it'd be just so amazing. Have you heard of him? And Carl Barth said, yeah, I shave him every morning. <laughs> and the man thought he was Carl Barth's uh, barber, thank you. Yeah. Oh my goodness. But you see the, the the attitude of wow, God has given me this task to do, and it wasn't he was all you know all about me kind of a thing at all. He had that cheerfulness about him. Our focus should not be on ourselves. Number C, our focus is not on our task. We can get so wrapped up in our task for the kingdom, and that sounds like it might be a really good thing, unless our motivation behind it is not correct. If it makes us feel important or we, uh, it, oh, you know, if I just do my job right, then I can move closer and be closer to God or something like that. Or, you know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I want everybody to see, I want everybody to be impressed with how hard I work for the Lord. And that is such a, the wrong focus. We should not be uh, so concentrated on impressing the people around us or even ourselves. We need to not take ourselves so seriously like Karl Barth, the story I just told you. Instead of being self-focused, D, our focus is on our loving Father. To focus on God is to not focus on feelings, not focus on self, not focus on tasks, but focus on a relationship with our loving Father. There are many things involved in our journey with our Savior, and the Psalms of Ascent have shown us some of them. The main goal in our life, however, is to bless the Lord, worship the Lord, praise the Lord, honor the Lord, um, uh, just kneel in adoration of the Lord. What a great place to end the Psalms of Ascent. Why? Out of deep gratitude for all that he has done. Someone said, gratitude follows grace like an echo follows a voice. Gratitude follows grace like thunder follows lightning, lightning. Grace is the cross. Grace is God providing a way for sinners like you and me to have a relationship with him. Grace is Jesus giving his life as a penalty for our sins. So, closing question. At the beginning of the lesson, we talked about how we began the Psalm of Ascents in Psalm 120, talking about Teshuba, the idea of, in Hebrew, of returning to God in repentance. What better way to bless the Lord than to turn our back on the way of the world and turn back to God in our deep gratitude. Wow, for all that he has done for us in his love. Let's, would you read the psalm with me? Let's read it together. Are you ready? <clears throat> Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord, Lift your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for your love and mercy and grace upon us. And boy, Lord, is on our hearts and minds, uh, maybe in a real special way as we head into the Easter season, although we should feel that way at all times. But Lord, I just, we just thank you. Thank you, thank you for all that you've done, how you have blessed us for, from Zion. And now, Lord, we want to bless you by living our lives for you, by honoring you, by uh, serving you, by serving each other, by worshiping you in community and all the things that we've been talking about this morning. And perhaps this is a time, an opportunity to, to Shiva, to return to him, Maybe you've walked away for a while or you've been in a not a good place and maybe this is the very day that you want to say, I am coming home. I am going to make my way to Zion. I'm going to make the pilgrimage 
And Lord, I want to find you at the end of that pilgrimage. Or maybe this is the first time, maybe you have never received him as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never had an opportunity to come to him for the very first time. And um, what an incredible time for you to be thinking about that at this Easter season when, when Jesus carried your sins and for you to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Thank you that you took my punishment. And now I wanna begin my walk with you. You are my savior and Lord, thank you. And for the rest of us, Lord, may we be very self-analytical about how we are facing perhaps the trials, perhaps the exaltations in our life, whatever it is, Lord, may we honor you with all that is happening in our life. And it's in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you.